the Royal Tour. Tanzania, the Royal Tour, is a film, or you can call it a documentary, that has featured or casted the President of the United Republic of Tanzania, Her Excellency Samia Sulu Hassan, as the host, welcoming the executive producer of the Royal Tour documentary, taking him through various touristic sites in Tanzania. Indeed, it portrays the beauty of Tanzania. The Ambassador of the United States of America, Donald Wright, recently hosted a question and answer with Peter Greenberg at his residence in Dar es Salaam. First was the introductory questions supported by viewing of various segments of the Tanzania Royal Tour asked by the Ambassador, Donald Wright. So it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get a chance to answer your questions as well. We will, indeed we will. <clears throat> well, in addition to welcoming Peter, I want to welcome all of you. I think many of you have been to, to events here at the Ambassador's Resident, but thanks for joining us again tonight. And Peter, I have to start my remarks by just congratulating you on this work of art that you put together. Uh, I shared with you, I think I've seen it four times now, and I could see it even more because these are so, uh, pictures that are so familiar to me, thank you. And I know that it has already been well received. Uh, many of you may know, I, uh, my wife and I, Kathy, had the privilege of going to the premiere in New York City last week uh, at the Guggenheim Museum. And we talked to so many people after, and the accolades that this particular uh, film received were non-ending. I have to tell you, and unfortunately I had my voice at the time, Peter interviewed me a week ago uh, uh, around uh, this particular event, but tonight the table is turned, and I'm going to be interviewing Peter. Uh, so, well, I've uh, already been grilled by Agnes today. She <laughs> Uh, and the format we're going to have is we're going to show a clip and then I'm going to ask you some questions about that sure. clip. So why don't we go ahead and get started with the first clip. So Peter, do you hear that music? You won't find that anywhere else. It's our version of jazz. We call it Tarab. It fuses African, Arabic, and Indian musical influences. And it's always brought all the cultures together here. And when the concert's over and darkness starts to fall, another show takes place. I like to look out at the sea, hear the dolls return home, and watch the lovers stroll arm in arm along the waterfront. Look at the young boys, Peter. They are showing off their bravery by running and jumping and diving off the seawall into the ocean. It reminds me of my childhood. Now, what you didn't see there was me going up with money. <laughs> she taught me. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. I, I think I shared with you that... Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Just talk. I think I shared with you that Zanzibar has a very special place in my heart as someone that was there 30 years ago and it's changed. Do, do, they, do the people here know the story? Oh, yeah, I think they all know my story. Okay. Coming here as a volunteer 30 years ago. Uh, but the things you show are so classic Stone Town. We're all smiling because we've seen those scenes multiple, multiple times. I think my next question is one that I'm probably most interested in. By watching the whole show, you had unfettered access to President Samia for essentially seven to ten days. Some of those days, I understand you started at seven in the morning, you finished at ten in the evening. Midnight. <laughs> Midnight. Uh, and I know you've interviewed a lot of people. Can you tell us your personal perceptions of President Samia as a person and your perceptions of her as a leader? If you look at her trajectory, it was unexpected. It was accidental. And when you look at the history of others like her who had similar trajectories around the world, a Harry Truman, 
uh, a Lyndon Johnson. These were people who were never supposed to be president. And then they made their mark. Uh, those people who take a look at the history of the two presidents I just mentioned, Harry Truman and Lyndon Johnson, you will find volumes of books written about how they changed and shaped their countries in ways that nobody ever anticipated, and yet they rose to, to leadership. And that is what we're seeing here. Uh, we're seeing someone who, uh, just like the King of Jordan saying, I never wanted a job, or never expected a job, that happened here. And you know, they don't give you a course, and you know, a three-year course on how to do it, all of a sudden you're doing it. And she's just celebrated, I think, her first year in office. And uh, given what she's been able to do in just one year, I think it's quite remarkable. Um, and the way that she tells the story. You know, we talk about Zanzibar. We spent a lot of time in Zanzibar with her because that's where she was born. And, and we, I went back to her original home, her school. She took me to her very first mosque, which was built in the 12th century and is still standing. Uh, and it was in that mosque where she was able to tell me how Islam shaped her values and, and, a lot, and guided her to where she is today. For an American audience, when they hear the word Muslim, they run. It was a very important conversation to have because she was able to identify and explain and truly tell the story of her path. And, uh, and I think that is something that you'll see in, in the show. Thank you, Peter. I think you gave a great synopsis of what we feel here in the country, that we're headed in a positive direction. It's just wonderful to see the changes that are occurring. Well, let's go on to clip number three. Against the monochromatic backdrop of the African plains, the bright and clothed dancers are quite a sight. These performances are not only a way of educating foreigners about Maasai culture, they also serve as one way of helping to keep their traditions alive, as their way of life is slowly being transformed by modern society. Their voices are their instruments. diversity of cultures here. I think there are 120 separate tribes. You featured the Maasai here. Uh, I would just love to hear your perceptions on the cultural diversity here, and what really surprised you in that area? Well, what surprised me in that area actually happened in Zanzibar when we were walking in Stonetown, and there was a huge Catholic church, and what's next to the Catholic church? Literally on the back of the church is a mosque, and everybody gets along, and they, they respect their schedules, they respect their education, they respect their culture, they obviously respect their religion, and they actually communicate to each other. The most important thing for me about travel and tourism is it breaks down those barriers. It, allows, it, it, is, it basically demands conversation. And when people actually do that, and they come to a country like Tanzania, and can have those conversations, it's amazing how quickly you find common ground. It's amazing how quickly you can sit and realize what you all share in common. And out of that comes understanding. I have to say that this is the area that I've been, one of the many things I love about Tanzania is that diverse religious groups 
have great sense of tolerance and understanding of one another. Here in this very place we're sitting, we had an ifar two nights ago, and there were representatives of the Christian faith, the Hindu faith, the Muslim faith, the Baha'i faith, all all here to celebrate a religious tradition in, in a sense of peace and harmony. And by the way, I, w I would love to recognize my wife. Where is she? My wife, Hande, who's Muslim. I'm Jewish. That should tell you everything right there. All right, Peter. Well, let's move on to the next clip. The president wanted to get a much better view and pulled us over. We'll check you too. We'll sit you. But as soon as I climb out of the car, I hear someone caught a glimpse of a lion nearby. And so I promptly climbed right back into the car. Over. Yep. I see it all right. It's only about 30 or 40 yards from us. And if it is a female yeah. a lion. We decide to follow her for a while to see what she's up to. And just a short time later, we're surprised by what she's showing us. Sitting on their thrones are most of the members of her tribe. These apex predators here are truly the king and queens of the crater. Very good. <clears throat> Uh, Peter, for, because I've always had a love of the animal kingdom, if there's one thing that I appreciate more about Tanzania than any other, it's the wildlife that you see in this. It's the rich park system and the abundant wildlife that you see. I know you had the privilege of visiting Gorongora and Serengeti, and that you actually saw the, the big five in one day. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that experience. Well, it sort of helps that, you're, that the president was driving. <laughs> <laughs> you noticed she was driving, yes. which is a lot of fun. Look, with all due respect to, to Kenya, I've spent three weeks there and haven't seen the Big Five. We saw the Big Five in six hours. Um, yeah. and, uh, and by the way, this is not a scripted show. They did not airlift animals there to have the waiting for us. <laughs> So yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. Truly a gem for this country. Well, let's move on to the next clip. To see a place, not many people have seen it. And I have to warn you, it's not a pretty place. Will you open the door, please? so much for showing this and as I watched the movie I could relate to everything that was in it except this one clip I've never been there uh, and I have to and what you just saw was a small part of the whole clip on that yes you'll see more when you watch the thing but I almost got sick to my stomach when I saw uh, what poaching had done to this country and I'm very proud of the efforts that the United States government has done working hand in hand with the government of Tanzania to tr prevent poaching from occurring and to uh, address wildlife conservation. I know you've uh, been to other African countries. I would just love to hear your perception of how Tanzania is doing in the area of wildlife conservation, maintaining habitats, the uh, intersection of rural communities uh, and parks, and the inevitable tension that exists there. Well, it really all gets down to one thing. It's the money. You got to follow the money. And then you got to connect the dots. Uh, when we were in Rwanda, uh, we had, they had a similar problem there, uh, and they finally had to convince the poachers that the animals were, were worth more alive than dead. And it turned into an economic initiative. Half the rangers who were with us in Rwanda were former poachers. Uh, and I think part of that effort is happening here as well, uh, because the demand is still there. That's the scary part. 
The demand is still there. You have to you have to stop it at the original flow of the money and redirect the money so that people can literally understand why it's a good idea not to do that. Um, and I think you're you're making great strides. You'll see in the, in the show. And by the way, from a tourism promotion perspective, there could be an argument: Why would you show this? Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I? I'm a journalist, and it's part of the of the of the challenge that the, the country faces. It's part of the challenge that she faces now, and it's how you address the challenge. You know, my my father once told me it's not a question of being right or wrong or good or bad or turning left or right. It's a matter of adjusting, and it's how you adjust, how well you adjust how sensitively you adjust and how quickly you adjust that makes the difference in the long term. And one of the things that came out of this particular clip is how Tanzania is now adjusting. And I think that's a story that needs to be told. Oh, thank you, Peter. Well, it's and, I, and I know the embassy is really committed to working with the host government in this particular area. I, I've sh I challenged them and I said, we want to be sure that this treasure is available for your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and your great-great-grandchildren. So we'll continue to be engaged in that area. Hey, I know there's people that want to ask you a question, so let's move to the last, last clip and we'll open it up for questions. My final stop, I was delivered to the fire end of a hot air balloon. The president had set up a surprise for me, an amazing way to experience the Serengeti. And before I knew it, we rose above the ground for a completely different perspective. Floating above the Serengeti is like peering off into eternity. In fact, the name comes from a Maasai word, a place where the land runs on forever. The National Park itself has been designated as a World Heritage Site and is probably the world's most famous game reserve. This is the way to start your world in Serengeti. I agree. Uh, Peter, my final question is, you know, obviously you had an incredible tour here in Tanzania. Uh, the perspective you got by riding the balloon, but the perspective you got of having a tour guide that was the president of the country is something I'll never experience. <laughs> quite, quite an opportunity. You know, with all the things you did for the seven to ten days you were here, if there was one or two highlights of your uh, visit here that you'll never forget, what were those? Oh my God. Well, one I already mentioned, which was uh, visiting her mosque. I thought that was it, was, it was a highlight for me. Well, you uh, a big one. The other one was understanding, literally, how everything came together. How she does her job. How she has to move forward and, and, and the way she does it. Uh, you know, we make the mistake as Americans thinking we understand the way government works. <laughs> we have no clue. Um, and and when you're with someone inside the bubble for 10 days, and it's not just a photo op, I'm literally with her for 10 days, uh, from morning till night, uh, you learn a lot. And it's an extended conversation. You know, if you're sitting in the car with her and you're driving an hour and a half, well, you're not listening to the playlist, you're talking. And, and it's what you're learning. And it's all about putting things in perspective. And that's what hopefully this does. And that's what I learned. So I can't give you one highlight except to say, I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. I think we're all jealous of the opportunity you had. Uh, I wish we could have had a similar opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Listen, I know we have a distinguished audience here today that are... It was a time for the invited distinguished guests to take flow on the questions to Peter Greenberg. Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to start with thanking you for inviting us here in this wonderful uh, residence uh, in Dar es Salaam. I happened to run into Peter more than two years ago, just at the beginning of COVID, with all the consequences. Um, and the consequences is that we are here tonight. Um, I have to congratulate you, Peter, that you became, after this meeting, the most popular 
social media American journalist in Tanzania. Yeah. Well done. Job well done. I have a very complicated uh, question which I'd like to have your opinion about. One of the challenges of the tourism in Tanzania is the past. And the past, the marketing was that you have good seasons and you have bad seasons. And I disagree with that. Tanzania is nice all year round. And it's all about marketing. So I'd like to have your opinion about the idea if the government, the airlines, the DMCs, the accommodations, the activities would work together and use modern artificial intelligence and algorithms like Disneyland is doing, like the Guggenheim Museum is doing, to spread the tourists through the parks and through time. Peter, what is your opinion about this? What can we do? Well, let me respond by saying, if there's one thing I hate, it's artificial intelligence. <laughs> What's in this room tonight is real intelligence. You can applaud yourselves for that. Yay. It's true. But Willem brings up a very important point. And that is, we, and the pandemic, by the way, actually was helpful in this way. The pandemic changed seasonality. It changed the seasonality of travel. There's no such thing in my book anymore. It never was for me. Uh, in fact, I'm writing a book right now called The Off-Season, uh, a contrarian guide to where to go when everybody tells you not to. Uh, but what the pandemic did is it advanced that thought so that there is no more off-season. I don't go to Paris for a suntan. I don't come here because it's not raining. You come because you want to immerse yourself. And enlightened travelers, and hopefully I've done something to help that, will embrace that and will do that. It's not necessarily about depending on any one entity like what William meant, like hotels or DMCs or, or airlines. Airlines tend to be, I, I'm going to say it right now, in general, I'm not pointing fingers, they tend to be idiotic. There's an old, there's an old saying, if you want to become a millionaire, start with a billion dollars and open an airline. You'll become a millionaire. That's the idiocy we're talking about. We talked about follow the money when it comes to certain things, like poaching. The same thing applies to, to airlines and airlift. Without airlift, you suffer. It is, you can have 80, 80 of the most beautiful hotels in the world. If you don't have the airlift, they fail. But you have to give people a reason to come. And people need that connectivity of information to realize they want bragging rights. Everybody wants bragging rights, right? And you know, if I'm sitting next to the ambassador on an airplane and we don't know each other, there's a reasonably good chance if it's a long enough flight, we're going to try to find out who paid more for their ticket. Right? <laughs> and then when we get past that part of the conversation, the next question becomes, well, where'd you stay? Oh, I stayed at the Serena or I stayed at the Hyatt. Oh, really? What'd you do last night for dinner? Oh, I just ate at the restaurant. Well, what did you do? Well, I went out with a chef who went fishing in his dow and came back and I cooked it with him in the kitchen. Boy, am I pissed off. He had a better experience than I did. So it's not about just seasonality. It's about thinking outside the box and showing that you can have an experience here that you can't have anywhere else or you can't have anywhere else better. That's what you need to focus on. And that word of mouth, forget artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence just wants to track data. I could care less. I want to talk to people. And the people that I talk to can't wait to tell me about the great experience they had when they went fishing in Zanzibar and came back and cooked it on the beach. Right? Um, just as an example. So if you want people to work together, that's what you do. Interestingly enough, at the lunch we had last week with the Her Excellency that you attended, sitting next to the ambassador was the head person for all route planning for United Airlines who cannot wait now to fly to Tanzania. Hey. Not a single U.S. airline comes here and get ready for a big surprise in about another year. Wow. I think they're going to do it. And you know what? They're not going to do it unless they have the support of everybody in this room. Right? they got to fill seats. 
but it's the way they're going to fill the seats that's going to make the difference. It's about experience and not how much the airfare is. Because if we learned anything with the pandemic, with pent up demand, money's not an object anymore. People will spend eight times more than they wanted to because they haven't been traveling for two years. Well, that's all for now. It's my hope you have been able to grasp more on the Tanzania Royal Tour.